Hello and welcome to my channel. In this video, I will be talking about The Curse of the Mist Wraith by Janie Ward. It's the first book in the Epic Wars of Light and Shadow series, uh, which has, I believe, 10 books out and one more coming. Uh, and this book is, is definitely one that is a bit hard to describe because uh, there is a lot going on, especially for a first book here, and it's setting up uh, what should be a, a massive, massive series. It's divided into different arcs. Uh, and like sections and parts and this is kind of the first arc. This is the setup for the whole entire story uh, So there's a lot going on this one. I'm gonna start uh, we talking about briefly about what it is and I am gonna start non spoiler and then I will talk some spoilers as well because um, I feel like I kind of have to with this book because there's so much going on and happening uh, so that'll come and I'll make sure to mark before we get there uh, but so let's talk about what this is so the the kind of the base premise of this book is that you know, there's this land called Athera and I'm probably gonna mispronounce everything just be advised but um, uh, called Athera and uh, many many years ago uh, Mist Wraith shrouded the land in a fog that just never ends and so uh, like not much sunlight gets through and so all these people just live with it. And around this time also the nobility was overthrown. They were cast out of the towns. And so you have the, the descendants of the nobles which are like these roving barbarian bands. And then you have the commoners who are the town born uh, who live in the towns and set up. So already kind of have kind of a juxtaposition from what you see in a lot of medieval style fantasy. Uh, and there is a prophecy saying that a descendant of one of the old high kings will come through a world gate, which haven't been discussed a lot, but do seem to literally go between different worlds uh, and then will be able to potentially uh, fight and defeat the Mist Wraith uh, and kind of restore order to the world. Things are uh, a little bit trickier though when it turns out that the, the magical power that's needed to defeat the Mist Wraith is actually within two different people, uh, which are, are two of our main characters, Arathon and Lysera, who are half-brothers uh, sharing a mother. Uh, and also the the sons of like rival kings uh, one the, the kind of more normal king the other one the pirate king uh, and so there's that kind of enmity there as they come through uh, and the story is setting up them basically being brought along to try to stop things uh, and go from there that's kind of the basic setup with it as well and so this starts out uh, quite different uh, than you would get, uh, once again, with a lot of different fantasy books because we open the book with kind of a, an introduction uh, talking about what's going to be happening in the book and how, like, this is, it's presented, uh, it doesn't really come back and do it again, but the prologue basically presents it as, uh, after the fact, some, like, uh, magic users went and like meditated to determine what actually happened because uh, there's a lot of facts that were distorted. But then we start in with the book uh, and see Arathon, who once again son of the Pirate King, captured and the Pirate King defeated and being brought before uh, the King uh, for justice uh, and ends up falling into the hands of Lysera, who then brings him there. So we start off not with this big battle, uh, but with the aftermath of the battle and then leading up to them ending up in uh, Athera, where we're going to kind of have everything happen. Um, this is definitely a book, too, where there is the main plot going on, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes as well. Uh, some of it's very clear, some of it's less clear. Uh, there are a lot of powers at play. I mentioned that we have the Townborn, uh, the Barbarian Nobles, that uh, obviously uh, very much are against each other, but we also have a Fellowship of Wizards, and then we have uh, like an institution of sorceresses. There's all kinds of different people all wanting different things, uh, and sometimes there's a lot of conflicting things going on. This is also, like I mentioned, uh, the, the kind of the premise of this book hinges on a prophecy, and prophecy and trying to uh, read the future is also very important in this book, because you have people who are trying to determine what's going to happen and then make those prophecies uh, come true, or if it's not the, the way they want it to go, to try and change things so that it happens. All of this with the um, kind of in the background right now as well, that there's an ancient 
Uh, there's a, a few different ancient races of magical creatures that are called Paravians that were essentially like not quite cast out, but all like disappeared uh, from the face of the earth uh, around the time all of this mist wraith stuff happened. And so there's there's so much being set up here in this book, uh, getting ready for the, the really, really big series, The Wars of Light and Shadow. Uh, we do get right up the, the bat, I should say, Arathon, who is the uh, the master of shadows, is how he's referred. He was trained as a mage, and so has a lot more understanding of that. Uh, was the son of the Pirate King as well, and also has a love for music. And then we have Lyser, who uh, was not really tutored in magic nearly as much, uh, even though he has the inborn gift of mastery of light, uh, but raised as more of the kind of typical, spoiled, like, foppish type of prince. Uh, and so very, very different backgrounds for our characters, and we see that in the interactions. And I've come to two. I, I love this cover, and I love covers like this. They're not common. But you can, like, after I just described who these people are, uh, now granted, he's holding a Lyranth, uh, but even without that, I feel like you can kind of see, like, the tortured soul here and the, like, the charismatic, like, oh, I'm very important, like, look even from that. So I feel like you get a lot from the cover. So... That's really what's set up, and I am going to get into some spoilers now. If you want to skip past that to where I just talk about the book and like who I think this will work out for or things to be aware of if you're going to read it, I'll have some timestamps there for you, but I'm going to jump into talking a little bit more uh, of the specifics about the characters and about the events uh, in here now, so skip past if you've not read. So uh, I, I set everything up, and uh, there are a lot of things here that happen uh, that are, are very, very interesting because there's some, sometimes they seem almost like they're bypassed, um, like at the very beginning when they both drink from a well that's supposed to give you an extra 500 years of life, which we don't really talk about again, uh, though I m imagine it's going to be pretty significant. Uh, and then as we, we go along, some events happen where it's not as big as you would think, uh, and some do. The the big thing I'm gonna jump toward the end is the actual like fight with the Mist Wraith. Uh, I thought that was gonna be a much bigger focus here. I mean, it's called Curse of the Mist Wraith. We know that literally what our brothers are supposed to do is defeat the Mist Wraith. We don't spend a lot of time with that because the focus is really so much more on the overall story and what that represents. Doing that ends up having some backlash with one of like the many spirits of the Mist Wraith possessing Lyser and causing him to try to basically kill Arathon and then cursing Arathon so they both have a curse that just like a geese to make them want to kill each other uh, to do more damage that way. And so it, that that seems like that's going to be the most important part, uh, pitting them against each other. I was wondering, because early on, they, they were very much against each other, which makes a lot of sense given their backgrounds and the fact that their you know fathers were warring kings, essentially. Uh, and so they already kind of had that, but they started to develop um, more of a bond and kind of an understanding of each other, I felt like. And so I'm like, how is this going to turn so that they end up doing that? And I will say... With uh, the idea of prophecy and with the idea of that being a curse, uh, which granted it does make the curse of the mist wraith, you think it's going to be about the mists, it's not! Uh, so I mean, a, a tongue-in-cheek title almost, once you, you finish the book you realize. I, I was a little on the fence with that particular decision, and that's why, even though that's toward the end, it's one thing I want to talk about, because it does kind of make it so that it, it's not necessarily their will anymore. Uh, with fighting each other, but it's something that's done by an outside source. So in some ways that could feel like it's almost cheating, but looking at this tapestry of a story as a whole, I do think it works uh, for a few different reasons. The first one being the idea of free will, uh, the ability to make decisions already is very, very questionable for both Arathon and Lyser. Not only were they both, uh, they're given essentially their magical talents at birth because of something that was set up ahead of time to like pass those gifts to them when they were born. Uh, so that already was done for them. And also we find out more about them later. Like not only are the Fellowship uh, wizards basically trying to control everything that they do to make the, the time and the, the timeline and the prophecies go the way they want because they want the mystery destroyed, they want the Pravians back, and they want the nobility back in charge. So they're leading them there, and Lyser seems happy enough to do it. He's a prince, that's what he knows uh, with that as well. 
although he tend he starts to seem like he doesn't necessarily relate to his uh, actual subjects, who he sees as barbarians. So it actually, like, for the most part, it kind of made sense for him to end up siding with the townspeople, and we're told that he's going to, but the curse puts it more so, it seems like the, the bigger effect of that was on Arathon, where him actually trying to kill Lysera is definitely not something he would normally do, but it fits. So the, the sorcerers are trying to control this. Uh, there's the prophecy in general. We also find out that both of these individuals also had a sorceress like certain parts of their personality are instilled in them via magic and they can't go against them uh, and that was done apparently generations ago uh, at the request of the the rulers at the time and so we see both of these people are really just kind of pawns in this grand game uh, that are being pulled in. Arathon being once again much more aware of it, which kind of just adds to his character as like the tortured musician who wanted to, to help to make things better and he's just basically feels like he's failed in that and he really doesn't want the responsibility, he doesn't want to be king, uh, he just wants to go play music and can't, but also is the type of person partially because of who he is, partially once again because of what's magically been like forced into his personality that he can't turn his back and he's going to do his best to try to save these people and to take responsibility of them uh, as well. And so Arathon was definitely the character I liked more, but I still like, there are a couple of things like that where it's, it's always a little questionable when you do that in a narrative. And at this point I'm willing to trust the process with Janny words because I've definitely, uh, I've read uh cycle of fire, like I said, from her and it, uh, it doesn't really do things similar, but there are a couple of concepts that are somewhat similar where characters are kind of forced to do something that they don't really want to do uh, in that kind of thing. And also the idea of prophecies, that sort of thing. She does like to play with them in a very different way than I feel like a lot of authors do. And so I'm, I'm willing to very much see uh, how this is going to turn out because this did, this did a ton uh, to set up a world. There are so many little things uh, with how this is written and uh, what's happening to set up. And we're really setting up for the, the start of the, the War of Light and Shadow, where Lysera and Arathon are pitted against each other uh, and are, are going to be, uh, you know, really trying to kill each other. Uh, interestingly, it's with both of them with the same, like, country, basically. It's just town versus nobles, but I imagine that's going to pick up quite a lot. We do actually get uh, some of those good action scenes with Lysera leading the townsmen and the headhunters against the uh, the nobility. Uh, but like I said, I, I thought we'd spend more time with the Mist Wraith. But I, I think I understand why it was done the way that it was because that was really that was the thing that needed to be done. It's very important. But all in all, it's you generally do kind of assume that they were going to defeat the Mist Wraith. I mean, and move on from there. And so once that's done, like we could have spent a whole lot more time with it and had that be the climax, but really that was just the beginning uh, of, of what's going to be happening. That that was the, the initiating incident of what's going to actually put the rest of the series off. Everything leading up is still important, but I see why we, we didn't focus to make it feel like that was it, because there was so much more to tell after that. I did love, for the record, too, uh, after sunlight is restored and everybody immediately panics, which sounds silly, but like if, if there has not and ever been like pure sunlight in your lifetime or the lifetime of probably your parents, grandparents, and long before that, like you've always lived in the reality of having this, the mist covering everything and you see sunlight, you would you would probably panic. That's that's completely uh, normal. But there was also, there was just comments about everybody panicking and people trying to make money and like the fact that like awnings immediately started selling really crazy, uh, which was realistic, but also just that little bit of humor put in in an otherwise pretty serious book. Um, I enjoyed, but I'm really interested to see where this goes. Uh, this did, you know, at some points the pacing was a little bit off, uh, and it is, obviously it's complex, but uh, I'm I'm very much still interested uh, and definitely will be continuing to see where this turns out because I do feel like this is really just starting to scratch the surface. So things to be aware of uh, with this book is that the, the prose is very complex. It is very dense isn't necessarily as like description heavy uh, as some, but it's it's very eloquent and dense and it, it is not simple or necessarily easy to read. Uh, and it is a book that will make you read slower because 
Uh, I, I found the simpler the pro is usually the quicker you can read. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, but like, you know, if you're reading a book with just more accessible pros, it's a lot easier to read through quicker. This is more the book you're going to have to take your time with uh, and really dig in because there's a lot of complexion to the pros and to the story in general. So be aware of that. I read it even slower than I probably should have just because I, I didn't have as much time to get to it. But it's got very long chapters uh, and it is not a quick reading book. I found that with uh, Cycle of Fire, which my collection, um, the whole thing was actually um, only a little longer than this first book because they were shorter books. But I found those books too, even though the prose is, is definitely different also took me longer uh, per page basically than it wouldn't otherwise so do be aware of that this is something too that i would consider a slow burn um there are the pacing i didn't think had a lot of issues necessarily but there are lots of parts where we're moving towards something uh, and usually a lot of that we get some character introspective moments uh, we're learning more about the characters we're seeing them interact uh, and go through everything and so it's it's something that i think works but this is not a fast-paced action-packed book by any means so this is definitely going to be a book that if you're going to read it you do need to you know be patient uh take your time with it uh and kind of go from there and i do think it's a good idea to probably read something else from Janie words um to get an idea of her prose and see if it's going to be an issue for uh, like i commented i have read uh, cycle of fire uh the trilogy uh, which was really good. That is more of a lighter version of the prose for sure that has some like really elegant descriptions, things like that, uh, but not quite the same. I have heard uh, a lot of people now recommend to write Hell's Chasm uh, as a good way to start because this is supposed to be very, very similar prose as well. I have not actually read this one. It is a standalone because I was already starting uh, Wars of Light and Shadow, so I can't really tell you anything more about it. But it may be a good idea before you start the 11 book series, uh, try something else out and just kind of see if it's going to be for you uh, or just get an idea of what you're getting into uh, because it's uh, it's completely doable, but it's also just one of those books that is it's not written like a lot of other books. It's definitely not written like a lot of modern fantasy books, and so it's it, it may take some getting used to for it. Um, so really, people who like uh, the you know very complex, long, slower stories are people who really like the fancier prose. Uh, definitely something that would work. Um, I have heard people compare this to Malison, and I think it's because of the fact that you're just kind of thrown in. Um, to it and it's this really big sprawling intricate thing going on uh, with all kinds of different people and factions and beings and everything involved this did not per feel uh, really particularly like Malazan at all to me but I think people who really enjoyed that kind of story where it is incredibly complex long you're looking at a lot of different things sometimes very small things uh, like that I do think pe people who are fans of that will find something that they enjoy here uh, as well because it's it does kind of follow some of those same ways of doing things I guess while also feeling quite different so that's kind of how I would phrase that I don't think it's the same or even similar whatsoever very very different uh, this has a lot more of a classic fantasy feel than uh, Malazan does Malazan had a lot more like uh, different elements uh, that were put in as well. This still feels very classic fantasy, but it, it feels like some of the most like epic, like completely different world uh, that I've read as well. So uh, I'd, I'd kind of put in that boat also for it. Um, honestly, like I said, if you're interested in trying Janny Words, I've really enjoyed Cycle of Fire. I really did enjoy this book as well. Um, and I'm very interested in continuing. I'll have to track down the hardcover for the second book. So definitely recommend giving it a shot. Um, that's kind of it. I, I probably could have droned on for quite a bit longer uh, about this book because I barely scratched the surface uh, of what happens in this book. But uh, this is already getting to be kind of a long video, so I think I'm going to wrap it up there. But let me know if you read this, your thoughts here, or if you want to chat in Discord about it uh, as well because this was definitely uh, an interesting experience of a read. Make sure to give the video a like if you enjoyed it. Check the link in the description for the Wizardly Duo Discord if you want to chat books, whether this book, other books, any books, or really any anything at all. It is a lot of fun and we would love to have you. And of course, if you enjoy my content, make sure to subscribe.